October 24th, 2017, City of Griffin Board of Commissioners meeting. Our first item this morning is to consider a continuation of the electric cost of service rate discussion from the September 26, 2017 workshop. Our commissioners ask ECG to present a proposal from the discuss scenario number three. The electric director Dan Thompson will address. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, sir. Good to see you all. Uh, as the mayor said, this is a continuation of our September 26th uh, discussion where you gave us uh, instructions and direction to look at the, uh, the logical scenario three uh, for your uh, ex explanation and, and viewing. And we have done some analytics and a lot of work on that. Uh, our ECG analytics folks are here today to present that to you. With that, I'll ask Ms. Sarah Leonard with ECG to go through our presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning. So as previously mentioned, I'm here to continue the discussion about the electric rates, that, which we started last month. Um, so first, I'm going to give a short um, explanation of a change, a revision I made to the projected revenues and expenses. This was based on an update to MEAG's um, projection of the 2018 purchase power costs. Then we'll talk about the rate proposal. I think I've handed out everybody a a copy of the actual rates, and that's what you requested last time we were here, is a, a look at the rates, including incorporating all of the various rate options that we had discussed last time. In addition, we, um, you asked for the rate impacts, which you'll see on the right side of that document that I handed out. And the last piece of the presentation includes the rate comparisons, and I added the projected rates into those rate comparisons, which you also had requested that we include. So since we met last time, MEAG released their preliminary 2018 budget for the purchase power costs. So there was a small change to Griffin's purchase power costs in 2018. It was a small increase of about $300,000, about 1%. And um, in addition to that, there was a small increase to the megawatt hours that purchased in that projection, and that was less than a 1% increase. So first, I updated the value in the purchase power projections that you saw last time. And it's just a change in the 2018 value. And this is the average cost in cents per kWh. And it's a really small increase. It was less than 1% change. But I did want to provide the, the information from the most recent projection. So I also updated that information in the projected revenues and expenses um, that we had looked at last time. So the power cost expenses in there have been updated for that 2018, the new 2018 value. As I said, that was about a 1% increase. That also impacts the electric sales revenue projection. So that um, I incorporated that the megawatt hour change in that. But I made another, when I was in the weeds of the rates, I saw that I had made a small overstatement of some of the, the average rate that was used in the electric sales revenue calculation for the projection. So I made a small adjustment to that. And the net, net result is a small decrease to the electric sales revenues compared to what you saw before. So I just wanted to explain, these are small changes, but I wanted to explain that I made a few small adjustments in here. Um, if you happen to compare these numbers to the previous numbers. And what that means is there's a small change to the scenario three um, percents that we were looking at last month. So if you can see in the top of slide five, I have the, um, the new scenario three numbers. They're very similar. It's uh, 4%, which would be for year one, effective January 1st, 2018, then 5% for year two, effective January 1st, 2019, 
then 4% for year three, which is effective January 1st, 2020. And the previous numbers were 3%, 6%, and 4%. So they're similar. So those are the values that are incorporated in the rate proposal that you have on the document that I handed out. And that was the first piece of the um, adjustments that we discussed. So on the next two slides, I'm going to just quickly review the different things that we discussed in September, just to remind ourselves. Some of them are directly incorporated in the rate proposal. Some of them are more indirect. But I'll walk through them just to, so we can all remember. So the, the next two on the, mentioned on the slide are the power cost adjustment and the environmental compliance cost rider. So those are two rates. They are, on the rate proposal that I handed out, they're actually just listed as notes at the very bottom. And you can see, when you look at the rate schedules, that they are applicable to the metered accounts, so everything but lighting. And those are the $2 per kWh rates. So they're very important in the larger proposal. The power cost adjustment, as we discussed last time, what we see with the other MEAG cities is that the city manager with the electric director, they are able to make adjustments to their power cost um, rate on an as-needed basis. What they're doing is they're monitoring their actual electric costs compared to their budget over the course of the year. They're looking at what their interim revenue needs may be, and they're using the power cost adjustment to help collect those interim revenue needs uh, they're able to do that without their commission or council approval. And sometimes those adjustments, they could be a decrease in the power cost adjustment. It could be a negative rate. Um, we see that as well. The um, ECCR, that's the Environmental Compliance Rider, that's similar in the sense that what we see the other cities are able to make, change that rate without their commission approval. But it, it's different in the sense that that rate is based on the environmental cost projections that MEAG provides. And that is, they provide that once a year, so that rate would change at most probably once a year, sometimes even not that frequently. So what we're recommending for Griffin is that the city manager with the electric director have the ability to change those rates as needed. As you can see in the fourth bullet point, they would come to the commission annually and um, report on what changes had occurred in those two rates. And then the final bullet point is that we're recommending that in two years you reevaluate the proposed rates in the sense of um, we know that there will be some power cost changes in the projections. Uh, there's the, the next projection coming out from MEAG will be in April. We're not able to incorporate currently the Vogel delay, unit delays into the power cost adjustments included here. So recommending that we take another look at this in two years and make adjustments as needed based on more current costs at that time and also revenue streams. So moving on to the next slide with the other rate adjustments that we discussed last time. You remember we discussed the fixed and variable uh, charge adjustments, and this was making increases to your fixed charges. These are your base charges and your demand charges. At the same time, is reducing the energy charges, and this is to better match what your cost structure is where your costs are mostly fixed. So when you look at the rate proposal, you can see that that is incorporated. Um, the example here is just for residential only. The, um, it has been... This change has been made on the other schedules as well. There's a small increase in the base charge. Um, you can see that there also are small increases in, in the demand charges. I tried to make them gradual to transition this change you know, more slowly over time, and to, that would help mitigate any rate impacts on individual customers. Um, and just note that I mentioned that the energy charges are reduced. You can see that in year four, but that effect is hidden in the earlier years because of those overall rate increases. 
The other items that we discussed last time is creating a school demand rate. This is moving just the largest school accounts to a demand rate. That was about 13 accounts. And if you remember the res residential multi-account that we talked about, that was an apartment building that has one meter on it, has about 100 units. And so that means we don't know the usage for each apartment. That rate does qualify for the large power rate. And I did check on this, and the other ap apartments in Griffin are on power rates. I did look at putting this account on a residential rate, but the rate impacts were quite large, even if you didn't charge for every unit, the base charge for every unit there was still quite a large rate impact, and it was determined that the large power was just a better fit to make that kind of a change. And their, their rate that they had been on was obsolete. So that, that was the change made there, so just keep that in mind when you're looking at the rates that that account it ha will be moved to the large power rate. And then the final item is the updating the distributed generation tariff, and that was just making updates based on changes that came out in the unit costs and the cost of service study. So those were just some changes, and those are listed on the later slide, just like what you looked at last time. So on slide seven, I just updated it from the previous slide that I showed you to incorporate the actual rates as they are shown in your handout. And this slide shows the average rates for each rate class, and it shows the current rate, and then each, um, and these are average rates for the, each class. So it's showing each average rate for each rate class for the current and then for the first three years. The uh, multifamily? That's, that'll go away altogether, and it'll be, more, it'll be more in line with the large power? What it is actually showing is the average rate on the large power rate for the later years. Yeah. It's just because that's one account, right. whereas the large power rate is kind of the average of all so the accounts. So there are other accounts that have residential that are currently in the large power scenario? There are, well, there are other apartment buildings on power rates it depends on the size, the level of demand. So they might be on small, medium power or large power. Thank you. So this slide shows the cost of service class margins. So that in the green is the current margin percent, which is really the cost of service margin percent. And the blue is the proposed, but it is year five proposed and that also incorporates uh, monies from the MCT flexible accounts that would be used to balance the budget. That's as we discussed in the later years where some of those funds would be used to help cover the increases in purchase power costs. So that's just the updated margin by class, and you can see residential is still negative but less negative. And then on slide nine, this is just the same slide, um, just recommending these, the changes in red for the update to this tariff. So that's nothing new. I just wanted to include that again. Um, the, the final section of the slides include the rate comparisons. And as I mentioned, it includes the, the proposed rates in there. I'm not going to go through these in detail because we did go through them last time, but I did notice yesterday there are no units on the graphs. So the units are the same as the units that you saw before, the KWH on the, on the baseline, and your vertical line is your dollars per KWH. That's your average rate. So for example, residential summer, a typical customer, 1,000 KWH, you can see what the average rate is for Georgia Power versus Griffin's current residential summer rate, which is in black, and then year one would be corresponding to year one effective January 1st, 2018, and so forth. So these are the same as what we saw before. I just have the proposed rates added in there. And on the demand rates, there's no units, but the percent is the load factor, and the other number is the KWH. And we did talk about this a little bit, but because I'm moving, making gradual increases to the base charges and demand charges over the time, 
that shift in the base charges in the fixed versus variable charges is not as noticeable on these graphs as you might think. Um, it's more subtle. But just keep that in mind, those are all incorporated in here. It includes the scenario three adjustments and the changes in the base charges and demand charges. Over the four year period, you, we should expect Georgia power rates to continually do an annual Right, well, well. keep that in mind that when you're thinking about the PSC rate comparison, which I did look at, Georgia Power's rates will go up, and other cities' the co-ops, those rates will go up too, so it does affect your place on those rate comparisons, but not, nobody's gonna be standing still, like there will be other people moving their rates around. And on the rate sheet that I handed out, if you look on the right side, The, I don't know if we can get the, the other file up. Right, there we go. So on the right side of the sheet, I have the rate impacts, and one of the things you had asked for are the, the rate impacts for the residential. So I provided the rate summer residential uh, several level, levels of usage ranging from 200, 500, up to 3,000. And so this is different from the rate comparisons which show the average rate. This is showing, for example, for a 1,000 kWh summer residential customer on the current rate, they would have a $117. It would change in year one to $121 and so forth. And then I include the percent changes which would be percent change from current to year one, year one to year two, and so forth. So there's rate impacts, sort of average impacts listed for the various rate schedules for your information. Any questions? So the current usage is, is, is determined by the household itself, the, the square foot in a home, what determines the cost the so you mean for the average rate yes, so you would take the total revenues for that class or for the customer and divide it by the kwh so that would provide the average rate Is, could you, re could you clarify? Could yeah, you, please you, clarify because I didn't answer it okay. clearly. Commissioner Brock, can you speak into the microphone, please? For the if I had a 2,000 square foot home, what would be the average number of kilowatt hours that I use in a month? Yeah. 2,000 kilowatt hours. That would determine your usage. Oh, your usage. Right, so it, the usage but in we're a. We're taking this off of an average of what people use, aren't we? Well, the, the average is just as based on an average for the whole class. Uh, meaning that if, if you look at the average, the average user, an average customer use about 1,000 kilowatt hour per month. So that I, I don't know what the square footage of that is, but it, a lot of square footage does not necessarily mean higher bill. It's just based on how efficient the house uh, the, the house is built or how much insulation it has, uh, whether it use uh, electric heating or, or gas heating. And so all that play into uh, the determining the usage that your particular home gonna have. Um, so when we do the comps, is it, we can't really um, tell you like what square footage you guys have, so we, we go by all right, so for on an average, if a customer uses 500 kilowatt hour if, uh, monthly, then here's the impact, uh, average 1,000 kilowatt hour, here's the impact. So it, does that answer your question? It does, yeah. So it's really not square foot, it's really just the usage of yeah. Yeah. assumption, right. yeah. I think I remembered in our average customer, somewhere around 1,000 kilowatts. Yes, 1,000 kilowatt line here is the, yeah. the That's average. That's what he just said. Right. Right, for, for, for Of course, Doug okay, Oldberg uses 
200. I used 1750 during the summer. My parents used 3000. So, I mean, we both, because they keep their house at 68, I keep my house at 78. So it's, yeah. I get, they get a $600 summer <laughs> utility bill and I get a $275. It depends on the weather. It depends on yeah. the weather and so how comfortable you want to be. Georgia PSC tend to like the thousand kilowatt hour comparison just because it's the average pretty much of the, the state per user. Thank you. Any other questions? No, but I'll have to uh, commend you on the immense amount of work here and presentations as all this data. It's, I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> <coughs> As a, as a math major, I'm, I'm in awe. I'm a math major, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to commend the city because the city does have, you know, uh, AMI, I think smart meter in place that allow to us to dig into the data a little bit better, and whereas the other uh, cities <clears throat> have not had that uh, or still contemplating that advanced technology. So you are, you're definitely... Uh, on the right track in terms of tech, uh, technology and taking advantage of it. I can support this proposal. I can go along with Ryan. Like this proposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can kind of range as well. I say I want to. I want to know. Um, I think a couple of things I'd like to know is just what is that actual like change in, in dollar amount. Right. Residential. Right. Pull your mic down. She can't pick up. Sorry. And the uh, school, as far as what the what that equated to, so I can look at the budget for us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so. Did, do you want the dollar amounts? Yeah. If I, if I could. Just He's the when school we, CFO. When you when you get a chance, I'd like to know what the impact. I can on. tell you that the, I mean to put. I don't know the dollar amounts off the top of my head. That's okay. Just yeah. When you'll get a chance. So you want the. A dollar amount change for the schools and, and the and the multi residential the multi residential that when y'all did that change. Do you want to buy the account or just a, what you used in your model as a total top line for revenue. for twenty eighteen? Yeah, for tw for the next year. Okay. Do y'all have anything else? No, but I have to say that it's obvious power costs are going up. We got to eat them somehow. But I I like. The scenario we chose with increasing the fixed rate more in line with our fixed costs. So, I think this makes good good sense. And I I did make those slow increases. Yeah. And especially the school, I put some time into making sure it was a more gradual increase. Yeah. No, I think it's a well thought out proposal. None of us like to have increases, but fact a lot. Um, I just, just for clarification purposes and in, in preparation for our November 14th um, evening meeting, I, I'd like clarification and Would direction. Would you turn the to, mic up a little bit? I'm having trouble. I'd like clarification and direction based on the discussion we just had to move forward with the uh, with the proposal that you had just seen. Not with good. the caveat that um, we're going to get you that uh, financial information for the schools. Can I just, so we're looking at the we're looking at the 14th to vote on it. Is that what? Sir. We're looking at the 14th to vote on it. That's when you're bringing back. Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, I'm good. Mr. Brock, you okay with the 14th? Yes, sir. I'm fine. I, I'm good with the proposal. Well thought out. Thank we'll, you. We'll have that ready for you. Thank you very much. Our next item is to discuss water and wastewater rate options for a rate increase to cover debt through 2020. Director of Public Works and Utilities, Dr. Brent Keller will address. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, Teresa, can you pop that up? 
folks can see. Mm -hmm. In your package, um, under the guidance from y'all last time, similar to the guidance to the electric department, um, we'll be looking to present these um, rate increases on 14th. Um, you had asked me to look at two, th an, uh, two different options. Um, one was to keep the reserve in place, which is approximately $480,000 a year. And then the second option was was to expend that, and so in option, so you can see, I gave you uh, a list of our projects, uh, list of the debts, and basically there's two options before you. It won't be as long as Electric's presentation this morning. Option one is to keep the nine percent in place and continue to book it, and you can see the rates there uh, an option two you can see that we're using um, the nine percent that's booked right now the the it's at seven hundred thousand dollars we spread it across uh, the rate structure and you can see by using um, the nine the seven hundred thousand dollars in place plus you're still collecting the 480 each year you can see the rates uh, in 2018 uh, on option one is 7.5% for both water and sewer. You can see by using that debt reserve um, that those rates dropped to 3.75% um, for water and sewer. In 2019 on option one, it's 2.5%. There will not be a rate increase in 19 until, um, <coughs> excuse me, in 2020, um, on option two, you'll see it goes in effect on July 1st. The same also in, well, that's in 19. In 20 will be your rate increase. So basically what's happening is you have a rate increase in January of 2018. You will not see another rate increase until 18 months later, which is July 1st of 20, and it will be 2%. And then also an option two, the following year in 2021, you'll see a rate increase of 1.5%. So you have the information in front of you. Um, are there any questions on option one versus option two? I think that's what you had all asked for. Well, I said then, and I'm a, then I believe, and I say now that I, I could not vote to use up the reserve when you never know when the next Irma or whatever is going to hit. So option one to me is the conservative, the one that's responsible, if you will. And to be the counter on that, option one banks money to pay for capital improvements on the water wastewater treatment plant. And so when we go in the future, when we go to the bond market to build the new water wastewater treatment plant, anything we pay down our wholesale customers do not get the opportunity to pay their fair share. And so we're basically punishing our citizens in the city of Griffin for the future debt load when we could pass the debt load on to all the wholesale customers by the entire um, Harry Simmons water treatment plant replacement through all the sh shareholders of the system. And at the same time, it gives us time to negotiate with Spalding County on the water contract and hopefully that is more favorable in our position than it is in theirs that we can reap the windfall of our risk. Wait a minute. So you're going for option two, is that it? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Because mm -hmm. if we pay down, if we bank money for the future building of the Harry Simmons plant, instead of it cost, say if it costs $30 million, we pay down $5 million up front. That means we only, the, the the rape, the wholesale customers will only pay for the debt service of the 25 million, not the 30 million dollars that our share of, that our the citizens of Griffin will be paying in advance. Well, I, 
quite honestly, I think that's penny wise, pound foolish. I think not having a reserve is irresponsible, and you don't have to pay it down if you don't want to. But to have the reserve sitting there, the purpose uh, of the reserve gives you a lot of options. The the purpose of the nine percent banking was to put money aside for Harry Simmons. It was for nothing else. That that was the purpose. But when you look at the also the way the rate model if you believe is, we're going to come out of the Spalding County with some enhanced position, I think you're you're being overly optimistic. And that's where negotiations will work out in regards to making sure that we are rewarded for our risk because as more gallons of water is sold, it takes it puts more burden on our city, the city citizens versus the wholesale customers. Their rates go down as our rates continue to go up as we sell more water in the long term. Just my two cents. Um, so I'm for option, I'm for option uh, two and then let's get contract with Spalding County that we can deal with it. Well, can we have a consensus or do you want me to, when we come before you on 2014, put option one still in and option two and then y'all can decide that evening? And remind, be mindful that these rates do go into effect also January 1 of 2018. Well, I'm an option one guy, I tell you. I'm, okay. I'll often vote because they choose. So well, I'll I submit both in the package on 14, and then you guys, um, commissioners, can <coughs> vote accordingly, correct? Final All right, list. thank you. Good job, Dr. Kill. Agenda, please. <coughs> thank you, Dr. Kill. agenda item is discuss keeps moving them implementation of tax refund intercept program trip for the municipal court staff attorney Jessica O'Connor will address good morning. good morning good morning well I want to talk to you all about increasing some revenue without raising rates so hopefully this will be a good conversation oh that's <laughs> we're, we're not taking those today. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next time. Okay, so what we have here is a program that was implemented by the Administrative Office of the Courts as well as the Department of Revenue, which allows municipal courts to enter into a program called the uh, Tax Refund Intercept Program, commonly referred to as TRIP. What that means is we can apply and have already applied and been accepted to the program upon your approval to um, intercept tax refunds, only state tax refunds from any kind of debtor from our court that has not paid an outstanding fine. These fines have to be over $25, they cannot be more than seven years old, and they have to be final, so no longer appealable. We don't know, unfortunately, exactly how much outstanding fines we would have for this program. Um, we ran a couple reports trying to get that number, but our computer software system didn't really allow us to run this exact report. We know we have a lot of code enforcement fines that are outstanding. We know we have a lot of probation cases that close unsuccessfully. We know we have a lot of payment plans that never get paid. Um, so we know there's a lot of outstanding money. One of the reports that we did run was over $280,000 that is outstanding. I'm not right. sure that that's really an accurate reflection of what we were trying to do here, but it's probably close. So it's a, it's a good bit of money. Um, what we need from you all, and I'll ask for this and a vote tonight, is the approval to go forward with this memorandum of understanding. So the city is going to enter into an agreement with the AOC and the Department of Revenue to allow us to figure out what our fines owed are, and then we will submit that to the Department of Revenue through the Administrative Office of the Courts and ask for that money to be intercepted. Um, I've provided in your packet a little uh, information brochure that they gave to me on average, they are intercepting about $190 at a request of about 630. So it's about six to seven percent of your request that you actually are going to get. It doesn't seem like a very high number, but right now we're getting zero of that. So six to seven percent is definitely more than zero. So we would like to enter into this program. It is still a new program. I think there's 19 courts right now that do it, and I think we'll be the 20th court to do it in the state of Georgia. It was a pilot program in 2016, and then also um, the first year in 2017. So we'll be in the third year um, with our 2018 tax season. 
we will need to approve this tonight because we have to have them come in. The AOC will come in and bring some staff to train our staff. Um, we'll also have to implement some software on our systems that they will provide to us. There's no cost for us to run this program. The AOC actually submits the administrative collection fee, assistance fee, into the uh, tax refund. And so they'll say, we spent $15 trying to get this um, tax refund intercepted. And so that will be in addition to whatever is intercepted on our behalf. Um, there's a lot of uh, safety measures in place for the debtor or the defendant in our court. They have 30 days to be able to contest our intercept. We have to prove that that is a valid intercept. If they don't contest it in that 30 days, then we will be able to receive that money at the end of the tax season. If they do contest it, then we have to have a hearing. Um, we have to set that hearing within 30 days or resolve it in some other kind of fashion. Um, throughout this program, the two years that they've run it, they've had three hearings. So we don't anticipate having a hearing but we may, and so we're also gonna ask that we appoint Judge Essery as our hearing officer. They have to be a state licensed attorney. They have to not have any kind of um, ties with the city and they cannot be a superior court judge because an, a hearing can also be appealed to the superior court. So he is who we've talked to and we're gonna ask for that recommendation for him as a hearing officer. Um, one other thing I think that's important to mention is that they will also have a chance before we even send this to the AOC and the Department of Revenue, we have to send that debtor a 30 day notice to say you have 30 days to come in and pay this amount. So they're not immediately going to be sent that way. They won't immediately have to pay it with their tax refund. They'll have 30 days to pay it how, however they wish. If they don't, then we send it to AOC and the Department of Revenue. So they get several opportunities to get it paid. And mind you, they've already had several opportunities to pay it either through probation or when they came to court um, or through a default judgment. So this is not their first opportunity to pay something. They've already been given several opportunities to do so. So I just wanted to get that information out to you all and I will ask for you to approve that memorandum of understanding tonight. W will there be any additional court costs and who's gonna pay that cost if they, if they have a hearing that makes it to Superior Court? Who's going to represent the city and what are we going to have to pay them to collect a $200? I, we, won't, we won't impose any additional court costs for municipal court. There is that administrative collection assistance fee that the AOC and the Department of Revenue split. It's no more than $20, but it has to be direct and indirect costs that the AOC and the Department of Revenue incurred. So it will change based on how much time they had to spend on that particular intercept but it will not be any more than $20 and that will come directly from the debtor. So if they owed us 100 bucks and then it costs AOC and Department of Revenue $10 to get that information together to intercept from them, then they're gonna have to pay $110. So it will not come out of our $100. Okay, so if it goes to Superior Court? If it goes to Superior Court and it will, I guess it will depend on who files the appeal from the hearing. Mm -hmm. So if we determine that we don't like whatever Judge Essery ruled, then we would appeal and we would be responsible for those costs. If they don't like it and they appeal, they're gonna be responsible for those costs. I would assume we haven't gotten this far that I would represent the city in that appeal. Okay. I mean, I just, I, I know we've had some disputes um, with some of our, um, charges and I can think of one in particular that was just totally reversed and and I would hate for us to enter into a program that we are is costing us money because of someone's aggressiveness so I mean, that's just my only concern about it, but I, I understand the program. I don't anticipate there being, you know, if, if there is any kind of disagreement, I anticipate that we'll get that in that 30 days before we ever have to submit it to AOC and Department of Revenue. I think that's why they don't have many contested hearings because that sort of worked out amongst the court clerk and the defendant before it ever gets there. If we don't hear from the people though, then and it does get there and they contest it, then we'll have to deal with it that way. But in two years, they've only had three hearings. So I don't know that I, you know, I mean, we could be the exception and have a ton, but I don't expect that to be the case. Any questions? I don't know how the others feel, but this seems like an easy, <clears throat> easy yes for me. Okay. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. All right. It's a win-win situation for us. Great. We'll bring it back to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Our next item is to discuss changes to the personnel policy main. Human Resources Director Miles Neville will address. 
Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Before we get started, uh, well, let me say this. When, once we get started, I'm just going to hit the things that I think are probably bigger changes than smaller changes. There's no reason to go over every single thing. But if you have a questions about something I don't go over, just let me know. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, I, uh, for whatever reason, forgot to put in here the uh, cell phone policy. We have a cell phone policy, which is uh, uh, basically revolves around stipends for people to use their personal cell phones. And I, whatever reason, I forgot to put it in here. I'm going to put it in here this afternoon. But it's really nothing that makes a lot of difference to you. It's just who gets cell phones, who gets stipends for cell phones and the importance, you know, what happens if you get a stipend for a cell phone is subject to open records and stuff like that. So I'll have that in here this afternoon. I somehow just missed it. Okay, um, I'm going to skip all the way, well not all the way, but to page seven, if y'all are good with that, unless you have a question about anything before that. Um, <clears throat> uh, at the, uh, the first, is yours in red like mine is and underlined? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Um, the, I don't uh, first know anybody else. I couldn't open the attachment, so I'm hearing this. Do we have it? Let's agree. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mr. Morrow is the only one who doesn't no, have I it. Open it but y'all could open it? No. I look over I'm looking at mine now. She's got okay. Well, I apologize. All right. Well, you um, hit the major yeah, ones. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, we got it. Middle of the page, the uh, layoff section. This is lawyer speak. Uh, the, uh, based on the uh, Brock Jones lawsuit, there was some ambiguity in our, in our uh, rules that we wanted to clarify, so the lawyers made this change on the layoffs uh, to make sure that we're better in compliance with what we need to be. Uh, down at the bottom of the page, overtime, we're just uh, spelling out exactly what overtime means and the fact that police and fire have different overtime rules based on the Fair Labor Standards Act. Next page, top of the page, reduction in force, more lawyer speak. This is uh, what our attorneys in Atlanta uh, determined we needed to put in there to make sure there's no, more, no ambiguity in our, in our policy there. Um, page, once again, stop me because I want to go through the things I just think are most important. Page 10, bottom of the page, employment of the disabled. Uh, these are just a few changes that uh, are consistent with the, some minor changes in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Act over the last few years. Page 12, bottom of the page. Um, we are adding a, a, the, some, a policy or some policies that we've had, just not in the personnel policy manual related to uh, sign on bonuses, uh, recruitment bonuses, and retention bonuses. Um, we instituted those about three, three and a half, three, three and a half years ago. Uh, it's very rare that we use a sign-on bonus, a retention bonus, or a uh, recruitment bonus. It was sort of uh, done when we were having trouble recruiting police officers, but uh, that's not been the case lately, so we are not uh, offering sign-on bonuses, recruitment bonuses, or retention bonuses very often at all. Very rare. Page 14. Um, Increase in salaries. Uh, we just made a few changes regarding certifications. Uh, we've, uh, in the past, had some situations where individuals were trying to get pay raises for certification after certification after certification after certification, and so we capped that at two certifications for employees. Page number 17. Um, Tattoos and other body art, we really didn't have a tattoo or other body art policy, so uh, we've in included that in here. And at the bottom of the page, uh, we've put in the uh, inf information related to our retirement plan. Now, obviously, that might change, so we may have to change this next year, but uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, there was no <coughs> question about what our retirement plan was and everybody had a copy of it to look at any time they needed to. Page 19, section 6.4, uh, <clears throat> reduction in f separation by layoff. Uh, this is more lawyer speak based on the uh, Brock and Jones lawsuit. Is there 
any issue, you mentioned tattoos, but piercings or anything like that? Well, that's, we call that other body art. Um, so we, we just tried to do something, you know, what, what we've learned or, or what I've learned is uh, millennials are, are more tatted up than ever it seems like and we don't want to, we don't want to uh, make, make a policy where they don't want to come to work here because we're so intrusive. So we try to uh, make sure we have a good relaxed policy but that it works for us as well. Yeah, most of them got so many piercing holes they whistle in the wind. <laughs> if they lived in Oklahoma, you couldn't stand the noise. Yeah, I, I'm one of those. I just, I just take mine out when I come to work every day. <laughs> the Dick Morrow comedy show. Moving we're... along, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Uh, page 30, getting close to the end. Bottom of the page, bereavement leave. Did you say 30? Page 30, yes, ma'am. Um, we've changed funeral leave to bereavement leave. Um, the difference funeral is leave. funeral leave, it's just to attend a funeral going back and forth depending on how far it is. Bereavement leave is three days for bereavement for the immediate family now. Not, so it doesn't matter. We're not deciding whether how far you have to drive or fly. It's three days. Three days. You can also you can also use sick and vac uh, sick or vacation if you need to supplement your your uh, bereavement leave. Yes, Mr. Wilson, sick. Yes, sir. You can. Yes, sir. <laughs> we're we're turning off the tape recorder now. I was too late. Sorry. Um, uh, use of city vehicles on page 34, pretty simple. We're just uh, defining uh, personal use of city vehicles and that we uh, uh, charge you if you take a city vehicle home for personal reasons uh, per the uh, uh, IRS regulations. And uh, last but not least, oh, I'm sorry, almost last, page 42. Section 18.3, Tuition Reimbursement Program. We've taken it out. We could put it back in at some point, but we haven't used this program in more than eight years. So uh, for now, we're just going to take it out. And last is uh, section, uh, page 46, Social Media Policy. Um, we have completely redefined. No, I wouldn't say completely, but we've our lawyers in Atlanta and uh, with GMAs, uh, approval have come up with a new social media policy to get us up to 2017. So we've uh, uh, put in this new lawyer speak social media policy. Going back to the tuition reimbursement, yes, sir. Why, why are we taking it out? We're taking it out because we just haven't done tuition re reimbursement in more than eight years. And people. We haven't had anybody to. We haven't had the money. Oh, okay. So. And so when people see that and they see it in the plan, they say, okay, well, you must be doing it. Well, we haven't funded it in over eight years. So okay. there's, Mr. Smith and I talked about it. There's no reason we can't bring it back and put it back in here when we can afford to do it. Gotcha. And then last, page 46, social media policy. Once again, that's lawyer speak uh, to get us up to 2018. These, these policies haven't been updated since 2013. So we're, uh, we're going to be in line with everybody else. And really, that's it, uh, unless y'all have questions about anything else. Uh, I would like to say, Mr. Morrow, Mr. McLemore, thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed my time with you guys. Uh, I'm going to miss you, and I love the rest of you as well. So I hope we'll have Man, a great I about, 2018. I, was ready to sing, I, 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 I love all of you guys. <laughs> this is, I, I, I'm going I'm to get on my pulpit just for a second and say that this is the best city in the world to me. This is the best job. I love you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You do a great job, by the way. Absolutely. I thought you were talking to me. I've only gotten four disciplinary letters since I've been here. <laughs> you had a compliment today. You should put that in your file, the newspaper. I don't put compliments in a file. It ruined my, 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 my reputation. reputation. And your invitations.
<laughs> well, I don't see. Is that it? Is that it? That's that's it. I, told I don't you. see less anything. Than an hour. This is the first one ever for a. Um, well, I just feel like we should just talk about something. <laughs> now I'm just kidding. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Exactly. We should got a motion Kenny. by Miss.